welcome to the fourth and final day of LadiesCon, and thank you for joining us for our online programming today. Uh, for this panel, we have Whitney W., uh, creator of Sober Rabbit, a webcomic about the struggles and successes of staying sober and, uh, and talking about addiction recovery and how readers and creators can find support in comics. Uh, for this panel, you can put any questions you have directly in the chat and we'll make sure that they get to Whitney. Uh, but right now, I'm just going to I'm going to turn it over to you, Whitney, to, to start. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Elise. And thanks, uh, ladies of Kamikaze and Ladies Con for having me. Um, I'm going to do a little presentation about uh, my experience with addiction and recovery and sort of how comics play into that. And if you'll bear with me, I will share my screen. OK, so my talk is Art Fix, Addiction and Recovery in Comics. Um, and this is a little panel from my comic, Sober Rabbit. Um, usually when I start Zoom meetings, I tend to say, hi, I'm Whitney and, and I'm an alcoholic. It's just kind of where I am in life right now. Um, I am an alcoholic and an addict. Um, I recently celebrated five years of continuous sobriety, which I'm very proud of because I'm someone who never thought that I would get sober and frankly, never thought that I would finish anything. <laughs> um, I've been drawing Sober Rabbit since uh, October, 2019. And that date is important to me because um, later in that month, right after I started the comic, um, pre-pandemic, I was a working comedian and I was headed to a show and I actually got hit by a car in kind of a fluke accident and um, lost some mobility. I have an injured right foot. Um, longer story than we have time for. Um, but what's important about that big event happening is that um, even though it was life shattering, and again, it's now difficult for me to walk, it um, enabled me to spend a lot of time on my brand new comic. And it also gave me a different perspective in terms of mobility issues and why accessibility is important in comics, but I'll get to that later. Um, so let's get into this. <clears throat> Let me go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, I want to mention up front that um, almost anything is easier than drawing comics. Uh, comics take a long time, whether you're doing um, analog, whether you're doing digital, it's tough. And I just wanted to mention that because when I was a younger person, I was really enthusiastic about being a cartoonist. And as I got older, I found out that there's a lot of things that are easier than drawing. For me, it was doing shots of Jägermeister. <laughs> So um, as you can see, here's some panels from um, my Sober Rabbit comic, The Farewell Party. Um, most of the time I was just thinking about shots and not drawing. Um, and that honestly kept me from what I wanted to do for a long time. Uh, active addiction took away time, resources, opportunities. Um, as much as I had this like persona as, of being this big party person, I wasn't really accomplishing anything. So um, I went to school for theater and I did finish that degree, but I don't really have much of a formal art training. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, largely self-taught. So anyway, parting was great until it wasn't. Um, I do want to mention that um, I'm going to share some statistics from some big studies from big institutions, but a lot of this talk is from my personal experience only. Um, I'm an expert on my stupid life, and even then a lot of it is foggy, so bear with me. Um, recovery, even the word recovery can mean different things to different people, so I'm going to be talking about recovery from uh, substance use disorders primarily. Um, so why talk about addiction? Um, before I got sober, my image of what an alcoholic was didn't really match reality. Even though I sort of checked all of the boxes for um, being an addict, uh, I thought that to be an alcoholic and to be a drug addict meant that you were, um, you know, you were penniless, penniless you were uh, unhoused, you were, um, your life was over. And in reality, um, alcoholism is very common. It affects people from all walks of life and the way it looks can be very different. I just wanted to point out that 85.6% um, of people 18 and older reported that they drank alcohol at some point in their lifetime. Um, and these are from the um, NIH facts. Um, alcohol use disorder, which is um, sort of the new terminology for talking about alcoholism, it affects 14.5 million people in the US. And again, whenever you talk about statistics of recovery, um, 
you know, that's, that's sort of scratching the surface of what's up, you know, there's probably actually a lot more people who are affected by alcohol, alcoholism, substance use disorder than we even know. So it's something that doesn't just affect a select group of people, it affects everybody, it affects individuals, it affects families, um, it's, it's a big thing in America. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, the pandemic obviously has caused a lot of changes for everyone in a difficult way. <laughs> I know that sounds so basic to you, like the pandemic is bad, but um, from the perspective of someone in recovery, the pandemic has been particularly devastating. Um, as of June 2020, 13% of Americans reported starting or increasing substance use as a way of coping with stress or emotions related to COVID-19. Um, overdoses have spiked since the onset of the pandemic. And um, from the early months of the pandemic, there was an 18% increase nationwide uh, in overdoses. Um, the facts and figures for 20, 2021 um, addiction is just staggering. Like I, that's a whole different talk that I could give, but basically um, as someone in recovery, the loss of in-person community, the loss of coping mechanisms like going out, um, the disconnection from friends and family, whether that's proximity or because um, of illness, you know, uh, it's just, it's, it affects addicts and people in recovery in a specific way. Um, the other thing that I think that is easiest to sort of sum up how the pandemic has affected people in recovery is that um, last year, more people died of overdoses in the US than any other one year period in our history. Um, and at the time, this uh, study by Dr. Nora Wolkov um, listed more than 93,000 people dying from overdoses. Unfortunately, I think that number is higher now. Um, but the reason why I stress this is that, um, you know, substance use disorder is massive. It affects so many people. I just wanna make that clear. Um, what do we know about addiction in terms of how it's depicted in the news and in the world? Um, as you can see from these headlines, um, stuff like addicts need help, jails could be the answer. Um, after hitting rock bottom, some addicts and alcoholics find a road to recovery. I feel like a lot of uh, recovery topics just in pop culture out in the world um, are negative. There's negative depictions of alcoholics um, and people who are you know, struggling with substance use disorders. Um, a lot of what you see is terrible news <laughs> that um, substance use disorder uh, you know, is, is everywhere. And also I feel like the way that it's um, talked about in the news is that um, it's just something that happens to people, sometimes bad people. And um, there's just sort of a distance between what it's actually really like and, you know, how it's depicted in our world. Um, I wanted to mention um, that depiction versus reality. Um, a lot of people are under the wrong idea that um, people struggling with uh, substance use disorders are bad people. They're of low moral character. Um, you know, America is still puritanical in a lot of ways. There's this idea that um, people become addicts because they aren't trying hard enough or they, don't, they uh, aren't trying hard enough to quit. Um, in reality, drug addiction is a complex progressive disease. Um, mm. Quitting actually takes a lot more than just wanting to. Um, and I wanted to mention too, for the purposes of this talk, um, researchers have found that about half of individuals who experience a substance use disorder during their lives will also experience a co-occurring mental disorder and vice versa. Those are statistics from the NIH and drugabuse.gov. Um, I wanted to mention that because uh, my comic Sober Rabbit sort of deals with both things at the same time. I'm someone who, um, has a background with um, complex PTSD, who uh, has had my own bouts with depression, anxiety, um, someone who's dealt with uh, sexual violence, um, poverty, all of these things sort of co-mingle to make it harder for you to quit if you do have a substance use disorder. Um, and along those lines, um, language about how we talk about addiction is really important. Um, I could link a million different studies about um, why this is important, but basically in short, um, the way that we talk about addicts, and again, I'm using that word just sort of for the 
uh, sake of being fast, but the way that we talk about um, people who are suffering some, from substance use disorders is important because that affects their care. Um, there's this tendency in the US especially for, um, for people who are white to um, receive help more than punishment and for people of color to receive incarceration and punishment more than rehabilitation. And again, those are, that's just me sort of talking off the cuff, but my point is um, negative attitudes towards people who are experiencing this, these issues affect how their care happens. Um, so in other words, if we thought more of uh, addiction as a disease, that affects individuals, affects families, then some sort of moral failing, it would be easier for people who are suffering from addiction to get help. And I mentioned that because comics deal with language. Okay, here we go. Um, it's important to think about uh, how we discuss addiction and how we talk about substance use disorders because um, there are underlying issues causing all of this. Um, this is another, uh, quote from uh, Dr. Nora Volkov, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, from the NIH blog. Uh, she says, to keep people from all ages from developing substance use disorders, our nation must address the social and economic stressors that increase the risk of drug use, such as poverty, housing instability, unsafe neighborhoods and schools, um, other effects of a changing economy, especially during the pandemic, including social isolation and despair. Uh, drug overdose deaths are one component of the deaths of despair that along with suicide and alcohol related illness have caused life expectancy to decline. Um, and again, that was uh, statistics even before um, the pandemic hit. Um, there's a de decline in happiness and a decline in health. Um, so moving on, this is very depressing. <laughs> is there any positive aspect to what you're sharing with us? And then I shared um, an image from my comic that's Brenda the Pigeon, Sober Abbott's best friend, choking from despair. Um, while everything seems really sad right now, there is some stuff to feel hopeful about. So let's talk about art. Um, there is uh, scientific proof that art is helpful. Um, just to gloss over a little bit this paragraph that I shared, patients with serious health issues have used art as a therapeutic approach to help reduce stress and anxiety and express emotions. Um, in peer-reviewed studies about uh, breast cancer, about um, chronic fatigue, uh, chronic illnesses, it has been shown that art can be this great helpful, healthy distraction from what is ailing you. Um, there's new studies that deal with the physiology behind art helping us. Um, one of those is something called neuroesthetics. Um, and again, I am a cartoonist. I am uh, not a professional. This is just what I've gleaned from research. Um, let me see. Uh, researchers have used biofeedbacks to study the effects of visual art on neural circuits and neuroendocrine markers to find biological evidence that visual arts promote health, wellness, and fosters adaptive responses to stress. The reason why I mention all these big science words is that studies have shown that even if you aren't someone who considers yourself an artist, there are big benefits to uh, working on art. Even if you're someone who isn't um, specifically in art therapy, um, neuroesthetic findings suggest it's not an experience exclusive to artists. Uh, this ability to shift your thinking, um, get out of yourself, sort of practice mindfulness, um, is untapped by those who do not practice in the arts. So in other words, art is helpful. Um, so how can comics fix all of this stuff? Uh, I've got some panics, uh, some from some panels from my comic. Um, I've got Shelby the Squirrel speaking in a meeting. I've got sort of a list of um, activities that I did to cope with grief, that's a comic. And then I've got Sober Rabbit holding um, an iPhone looking terrified. Um, and again, this is the opinion part of the talk, not a scientist, only a little bit smart. Okay. Um, with everything terrible going on in the world, um, why would we focus on reading and writing comics right now? Um, as an artist, this is something that I've struggled with during the pandemic, this idea that like, oh my God, there's so much going on in the world that I can't fix. I can't fix income inequality. I can't fix, um, you know, all of the civil rights abuses going on in our country. So, so why would I read and write comics? Um, just to throw some big ideas out there, reading comics is a positive means of distraction and escape. Reading can lower stress levels. Again, that's according to science. 
Reading comics, usually more images than text, can build confidence for struggling readers. There's a wealth of comics that um, don't have any dialogue. They don't have any text whatsoever. You don't have to speak a certain language to read the comics. Um, it's, it's a visual medium. So um, ultimately, I just wanted to point out that reading comics from a range of authors will expand your worldview and deepen your connection to others. In this time where everyone is so isolated, even in the best circumstances, comics are a portal to a better world, to a better time, to understanding others and deepening your connection. Um, I wanted to mention that um, while there's a lot of um, difficulties right now, it kind of hasn't been easier to read comics for free. I just wanted to point out a couple of these because um, one of the barriers to me collecting comics when I was younger is that I didn't really have the money to go out and buy a new issue of every superhero comic. I was the sort of type where I would buy like used trade paperbacks, um, you know, uh, like collecting uh, volumes of comics. Um, and uh, that's sort of why I was drawn to indie comics and mini comics and, you know, just free comics that people left at the library. Um, but nowadays, if you're a young reader, if you're someone who's really tech savvy, there's um, fantastic ways to read brand new comics for free. Um, my favorite is Hoopla, Hoopla Digital. Um, it, all of these apps connect with your library card and enable you to check out um, books and comics and movies and uh, music from other libraries. It's, it's really fantastic. So Hoopla is a great one. Uh, there's Libby, there's Overdrive. Um, and also uh, I talked about um, unhoused people earlier. There are uh, more and more libraries that are pushing to um, do away with restrictions library card access. So in other words, um, many libraries are pushing to not require a, a home address, which for some people can mean that they can't get a library card. Um, but I just want to throw that out there. Um, Hoopla is particularly good in that they will let you, um, they'll let you check out um, books that are recently uh, Eisner Award winning, uh, I think Ignatz, um, they have a couple of uh, different section headers that will show you award winning comics. So that's something that I didn't have access to as a kid that I think is really cool. Um, the reason why I mention um, the ability for comics to bring you into a different world is that um, comics, which sort of, you know, if you read about comics history started as this kind of low pulpy art form, have turned into a billion dollar industry. Um, 2020 sales of graphic novels via the bookstore channel were 645 million. Um, comic shops sold less, buy from your local comic shops. Um, but the reason why I mentioned the, the money um, aspect of this, and I linked some graphs about how in past years, comic sales are just growing and growing and growing, is that if you're a comic creator, this is a big industry. This isn't something that only a few people like. Tons of people read comics, whether that's exclusively superhero, exclusively indie, um, it's a big, a uh, cozy industry where you can find, um, odds are you can find something that you like to read. So I mentioned that because um, some people have never read a comic and it's, um, you know, whatever your, your gateway to comics is, there's plenty of them. Um, so I wanted to uh, spend a second talking about um, barriers to making comics, barriers to making art. Um, when I talk about recovery and addiction, I often talk about this because uh, in my own experience, I didn't finish things in active addiction. Um, and I think that part of the reason why I didn't have much success as a younger person other than drinking and doing drugs is I sort of had these wrong ideas about what an artist was or what you had to be to be an artist. So I just wanted to talk about some myths that can be harmful for artists. So here's a myth. If the artist is suffering, they must be deep. Um, in reality, <clears throat> a lack of resources and a lack of financial support actually um, keeps you from making comics. Um, I can tell you as the quintessential starving artist, <laughs> oh, sorry, roommate's dog is barking. Um, as an artist, uh, it's better when I can uh, be happy and healthy and make stuff. Um, here's another myth. Uh, all artists use drugs and alcohol to get their ideas. Um, in reality, 
a lot more people than you would think are sober. Um, I came from the stand-up comedy world prior to getting big into visual art. So I just wanted to say a lot of people that have this image of being this hard drinking, hard drugging person, um, they're actually sober. And the reason why they're sober is because it's easier to do your craft when you're sober. Um, here's another myth. All great artists must succumb to their madness. Um, it sounds brutal, but I'm just gonna say it. If you're dead, you can't make comics anymore. That's not true. Um, so here's another artist who isn't a uh, exclusively a comic maker, but he is a visual artist. We've got a picture of David Lynch with a quote. He says, uh, stories have always held conflicts and contrasts, highs and lows, life and death situations. And there can be much suffering in stories. But now we say the artist doesn't have to suffer to show suffering. You just have to understand the human condition, understand the suffering. Um, I recommend David Lynch's book, Catching the Big Fish to people in um, early sobriety because I think it's a great um, primer in how the better you feel physically and mentally, the better you can create art. Um, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, all those things, um, while some would say, oh, they deepen your art, it, it kind of holds you up, you know? Um, so in that book, David Lynch has this great passage about how even though his movies basically deal with violence and sadness and darkness, you know, if you think darkness, you think David Lynch, or I do anyway, um, he actually comes from this place of, of joy, of, um, you know, liking making things. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out because uh, the idea of the tortured artist or the, the moody artistic genius um, that's something that kind of held me back personally from, from getting stuff done. I thought that I had to constantly be in this big place of conflict to generate ideas. And I think really it just sort of, um, you know, kept me from finishing things. Um, so I really liked this uh, essay by Megan Hunt in the link. She said, um, the tortured artist is an idea that's long been ingrained in our collective psyche, but it's important to remember that we always have the power to replace a bad idea with a better one. Um, I think in the pandemic, there has been this shift to um, maybe need, we need more self-care, maybe we need more mindfulness. And I think that that's a really positive trend. Um, my comic, Sober Rabbit, does explore toxic positivity. So anyway, you can go too far with that. Um, so. Uh, why talk about comics and why talk about people in recovery? Um, I think that there's kind of a twofold thing here. If you're someone who's in recovery and you're looking for support and you're looking to connect with other people, um, for me anyway, reading was uh, kind of the beginning of that. I started reading books. I started reading the, you know, uh, drunk memoirs. Um, from people who had uh, gone through similar stuff that I had. Um, I read comics about addiction. I read um, comics about uh, finding 12 step groups, starting therapy, that sort of thing. Um, but on the other side of that, for people who haven't experienced substance use disorder or, or eating disorders or sexual violence or any of these things that make it harder to be an artist, um, comics can build empathy for the, exper for the experiences of others. Um, as I mentioned before, there's plenty of comics that don't have any language at all, don't have any text. Uh, comics transcend language and cultural barriers. Um, I wanted to mention here that there's, um, in the past couple of years, there's been a push for having audio comics, having tactile comics, um, having comics that uh, readers with um, who are blind or who have low vision uh, can enjoy comics as well. So um, there's just there's just so many more things that can mean comics than they did when you know when I was a kid when my parents were a kid and it only meant a superhero comic book you know. Um, but most importantly about um, addiction and comics, I feel like comics can examine difficult to talk about subjects simply and visually. Um, as anybody with um, a lot of therapy, a lot of 12 step meetings, a lot of recovery under their belt can tell you, um, the more you, um, the more sober you get, the more you realize that there's a lot of underlying issues to work on, or there was for me anyway. Maybe, maybe you have it easier, I don't know. Maybe you have it harder. That's the thing about recovery. It can mean so many different things to different people. Um, but what I love about comics is, um, they're absorbing, you know, they can take you out of this experience. If you're having a terrible day, you can be pulled out of that into this different world that someone else has provided for you. 
Um, so I wanted to take this part of the talk to show a couple of great comic panels. Um, the first one that I have is uh, from The Wonderful Nancy by Ernie Bushmiller. Uh, There's a really old comic. Lots of people have um, remixed it. There's a lot of new Nancys out there. This is the original. Um, and this panel, it's black and white. And Nancy, who's a little girl with um, big puffy hair and a big bow and kind of a blank expression, um, she's got a mirror put in her bed and she's looking at it. I just think that this is beautiful. Um, I don't know, does it mean self-examination? Does it mean um, acknowledging yourself? I just love the look of this comic. Um, great. And just wanna check that. Um, this is a panel from Alison Bechdel's Fun Home, which if you haven't read it, go get it immediately. It's one of the first comics that I picked up in the library when I didn't have a job, anything else to do. And I read it start to finish and I almost just sat down and read the whole thing again. Um, but I love this panel because um, it shows a baby, Allison in the comic sitting with her dad at a diner. And she's looking at a, a very butch person who is a delivery person for this diner. And the caption says, I didn't know there were women who wore men's clothes and had men's haircuts, but like a traveler in a foreign country who runs into someone from home, some, someone they've never spoken to, but know by sight, I recognized her with a surge of joy. Ooh, that gives me chills as a queer person who grew up closeted in the South, just to throw that out there. Um, oop. Um, this is a this is a newer comic. This is uh, from Hot Comb by Ebony Flowers. Um, this is a four panel comic. Um, there's um, the heroine is looking into um, I believe her mother's bedroom. It could be an aunt, I can't remember, but she's looking into the bedroom, looking at the thing. She's touching all of the uh, older woman's hats. She's touching some wigs. Um, I just think that final panel is beautiful. The recognition of um, someone in your family being like you, or maybe having knowledge that um, you don't have yet. Her, uh, the little girl putting her fingers into the wigs is so pretty. Highly recommend that. Um, one of my favorite comic artists is Simon Hanselman. Uh, they just released a book called Crisis Zone, which is one of the first comics published to deal um, exclusively about the events of the pandemic. Um, this is a great panel. I won't read the whole thing, but basically it's Meg the Witch um, from Simon's comics um, meeting up with her mother, who is uh, a person who struggles with heroin addiction. Um, and uh, it's really poignant. Uh, you can see that Meg is recognizing how much her mother has aged since she's last seen her. It's um, Those comics are really brutal and also deal a lot with um, substance use disorder, with poverty, with uh, gender identity, with sexuality. Love Simon Hanselman. Um, now, I'm not a superhero comic person myself, but I wanted to throw one in. Uh, there was kind of a, um, a big shift in Iron Man comics um, from the 70s to the 80s, and there was actually a period where Tony Stark um, in the comics dealt specifically with alcoholism that actually prevented him from doing his superhero stuff. Um, in this first panel, um, you can see that Tony, who is probably very drunk, is crawling towards a bottle that is um, in the perspective of the, like the bottle is rolling towards you, the reader. And he says, you don't understand if you could be inside my skin, if you could feel what I'm feeling, you'd know. Um, now, one of the um, Iron Man writers was someone who was in recovery. So I think that that's really interesting. Uh, the final panel is uh, Captain America walking away and mentioning that because his father was an alcoholic, he knows that until you're ready to deal with it, there's not much to do. So he says, you know, let me know when you want to be helped. Um, I thought that's... Um, kind of a beautiful image. Um, I wanted to mention um, this, uh, there's also this um, great uh, website that I can link at the end where um, some incarcerated artists share their work. And I thought this was a fantastic one panel comic by Marcus Bedford Jr. Um, it says America's war on urban terror and it's a police officer pointing his finger at a child in a crib who is uh, wearing a hoodie. There's also another baby in diapers crawling around with a hoodie and that just sort of touches on where we are right now. Um, the war on uh, urban terror, the war on drugs, all of this really affects um, people who are in recovery. So um, I wanted to share something lighter. Uh, this is a, from Brad Neely's Crease Comics. Um, it's a little boy <laughs> in uh, an alligator suit who's uh, trying to get away from his mom who's holding pants and it says, no, my life is better like this. That's how I feel as an artist. Leave me alone, leave me to job. Um, and then I wanted to share a panel from my own comic. Um, 
earlier in the pandemic, I lost my best friend um, to substance use disorder, to mental illness. Um, my lifelong best friend passed away in August of last year, and it's been the most difficult thing that I've dealt with in sobriety. One of the things that's helped me is um, drawing and writing about it and being honest about it. So this is a panel from Silver Rabbit called Coping Skills. It says, activities I completed to distract myself from grief. Uh, in the first panel, Rabbit's applying comics. I'm applying comics, applying lipstick. In the second, um, chopping vegetables, drinking coffee, um, in a Zoom meeting, listening to rain sounds, uh, eating uh, Chinese food. And then um, in the rest of these panels, Rabbit is soaking in the tub, uh, watching cartoons, looking at ice cream in the freezer, uh, shaving a big chunk out of their hair, like I often do, um, reading The Body Keeps the Score, which is a great book. Um, and then ultimately just sort of lying awake and, and still dealing with those things. Um, that's just sort of a window into where I am. Um, the last comic that I wanted to share is from John Callahan, who is a wonderful comedian. He, and, comedian and a writer. He passed away in 2010. Um, he was a wheelchair user. He was a uh, recovering alcoholic. He's someone who um, I found out about even before I got sober and was a big influence. Um, in this comic, there's two sort of haggard looking men wearing uh, beanies and they're only heads in wheelie carts. Um, one, the guy on the left has an eye patch and the guy on the right who doesn't is talking to him and says, people like you are a real inspiration to me. Um, comics can be a great way to talk about disability and privilege and um, again, toxic positivity. So uh, I wanted to wrap up just by talking about um, if you're someone who is new to comics or you want to get into it, how do you even get started? Um, it's kind of never been easier to make your own comics. And I wanted to point this out that some of the best, most award winningest comics like by Linda Berry, by Simon Hanselman, um, by um, Emil Ferris too, uh, were drawn with grocery store brand stuff. You don't need like an expensive tablet. You could just, you know, use a pen and paper. Um, online publishing platforms, uh, Webtoons, Tapas, um, all sorts of uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, that sort of thing are great places to share comics. No one's stopping you. Um, if you would like some further inspiration about getting started with comics, about um, learning visually, about how inference from comics reading can help kids, I really recommend two books by uh, Linda Berry, um, Making Comics, which is basically her um, famous, famous comics workshops in a book. Uh, you can basically take a class with Linda Berry while reading it. It's so good. Makes me want to cry. Um, and then there's other books like Picture This, where um, Linda talks about the importance of art, the importance of overcoming your, your demons to sort of, you know, get your art, art out there. Um, comics open your brain to something better than your complicated, painful reality. I wanted to end with sharing a panel from Making Comics. This is about uh, reading art. Um, it's a, a mom dog and her little baby, who's a little nugget. Um, the mom says, I'm not sure how to look at art. And the little baby says, what's supposed to happen? And they're looking at a picture of what looks like a mother holding a child. And the second panel, the mom says, something big, a revelation. Suddenly you just understand. And the baby looks kind of confused. And this panel, the mom says, not sure how to make it happen. And the baby says, how about lift me up so I can see better? And in the last panel, the mom is holding the baby, which um, is reflected in the work of art. Um, and the baby has this sort of uh, uh, expression of wonder. Oh, I get it. Um, that's all I wanna talk about. Uh, if anyone would like to um, ask any questions or uh, for me to clarify or talk more about anything, um, I'd be happy to. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Whitney. Um, uh, I have a question. If you are comfortable talking about it, could you talk a little bit about your creative choice in making your own comic, um, Silver Rabbit? You know, you're using animals rather than people. Was that a, a sort of a, a conscious choice or is it like what you like drawing better or, or how did you get there? Um, kind of all of the above. I started learning to draw um, by drawing Hanna-Barbera characters from, I think, a book that my grandma had given me. And I remember trying to draw Mickey Mouse. I remember trying to draw Goofy. And I think um, maybe because animals have kind of, um, and cartoony animals too, have uh, ridiculous proportions. It's easier as a kid for me to sort of mess up and it would still look like a dog. Like Goofy is Goofy, you know, draw a nose and you got Goofy. Um, so I think when I set out to draw my comic, 
um, I was doodling um, little comics of this rabbit uh, drinking whiskey and then throwing up and I showed it to my friend thinking it was really sad and poignant and she was like actually that's really funny <laughs> you should like expand on that and so I think um instead of um writing a blog post or writing like some big like hoity-toity novel it was kind of easy for me to talk about my own alcoholism and addiction by using something cute so um, I knew that um, also I'm not very likely to finish things. And so if I drew a black and white comic with something that was fairly easy to draw, that's something that could um, increase my chances of success. And uh, I've always liked drawing rabbits too. So it's just sort of like a combination of, the, of all of those things. And I thought that um, everything, all the choices in the comic just sort of follow after, okay, if you have a chubby little white rabbit, oh, it's funnier if his friend is this big tall giant pigeon who's anxious. You know, so I think that um, animals are just hilarious and that's just uh, maybe an easier way to talk about something really difficult versus uh, the reality of humans and human faces and, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do a, a quick call and just see if there are any other um, questions out there. And if you do have any, you can put them in the chat. Um, and if not, uh, then thank you so much for your uh, for sharing this presentation and for your candor, frankly. Um, I, I really appreciated um, the honesty and your willingness to, to share something that is, is not an easy topic to talk about, but the more we talk about it, um, the easier it gets maybe and, yeah. and opens the door for other people to, to feel like it's okay to talk about. Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that, Elise. Um, I just wanted to mention, if you want to read Sober Rabbit, you could read it at soberrabbit.com or you could read it on Instagram, uh, instagram.com slash sober rabbit. And I wanted to just throw out one more thing. If you're someone who is struggling with substance use disorder, if you're struggling with all these awful things that happen to you, uh, try my art. Art is great. <laughs> Other people have uh, conveyed emotions that I haven't been able to in comics and have, you know, sort of put themselves out there first. And that's kind of allowed me to do it. So comics kind of saved my life. Thanks. That's so nice. Um, actually, we do have a question that came in. If we, We've got a couple more minutes, if you're willing. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I think you touched on this in your presentation, but can you talk a little bit more about how do you feel about the mainstream media's portrayal of drugs and alcohol and its impact on people. Uh, just curious about your thoughts as it's hard to find work like yours that deals with true reality. Oh, that's so nice. Um, I think that um, one of the things that drove me to do Sober Rabbit um, is I hadn't seen a lot of aspects of the everyday parts of recovery. Um, I think that there's a lot of portrayals in movies um, TV podcasts, you know, like murder podcasts are, are big right now. They don't really talk about um, what happens to people who recover from violence, who recover from drinking, you know, all of those things. And so um, when I started drawing Sober Rabbit, I wanted to talk about um, this is what it's like. You, um, in my experience anyway, I go to a meeting, I talk to other people, I get a little bit of insight. Um, I learn about all of the causes of addiction, which again, like I said, are systemic. It's income inequality, racial discrimination. Um, the war on drugs has been so harmful to people who are in recovery and trying to get better. Um, so I sort of wanted to put out, um, here's one person's perspective on it. And I think that um, there are some comics that deal specifically with recovery, but I feel like recovery and um, addiction are often still used as punchlines. Um, I personally hate that a lot of comics books use sexual violence as an origin story. I hate that they use um, abusive parents who are suffering from you know, addiction problems as this jumping off point, because I feel like if you're using um, this sort of like lewd, you know, gaze of recovery, it doesn't really cast a positive light on people who are actually struggling. Um, so I think that there could be um, more accurate portrayals of uh, substance use disorder and, you know, recovering from all of those things. And so, um, you know, I, I released my comic for free on Instagram. It's one way for, you know, me to combat that. Um, but I also think that during the pandemic, like I said, there has been the shift to um, maybe we do need more self-care. Maybe we do need more mindfulness. Uh, I've personally met a lot of people who have gotten sober during the pandemic. And some of them have gotten sober by going to 12-step meetings online, which again, like you wouldn't have even thought that that was a thing. Um, that's also something that's helped me with my mobility issues, being able to go to meetings and reach out to sober people for support online. So I just wanted to mention that even though the um, 
pop culture perspective of addicts is that they're doomed, penniless, bad people. The reality is that a lot of people deal with this stuff and we should probably have better representation. So I'm, I'm just trying to help with that is <laughs> where I am. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we're pretty much close to time. So uh, just another quick last call for, for questions. Um, Otherwise, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I feel like we've really just sort of scratched the surface here. And so um, I hope that we could have you, you back. Maybe you'd like to come to another uh, Ladies Con and continue to talk more about this topic. I would love it. Thank you so much for providing a platform for uh, women and non-binary people and LGBTQ people to show off their comics. So I look forward to it. Thanks.